that, made great careers for themselves, and they've taken off financially. And I would say, how about them? And how about the number of them that after all of that, at the end of their life, contemplate suicide because they're completely miserable? And I have seen so much of that that I am thoroughly convinced that none of those things will take the place of God in your life when you come to that last and final conclusion that you are going to die and you will go someplace. And then you look back at your life and you look at what could have been a wonderful legacy for the, world, for the Lord. But you've left nothing but a wake of disaster and people suffering. And that's what happens when people live a life absent of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says that the Son of Man, that's Jesus, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Good thing. Luke chapter 4 verse 18 says, He came to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. If you don't know what oppression looks like in a life lived today, it's only because you lack knowledge and familiarity with the Bible. If you don't want to see those things, stay far away from the Bible. Because the moment you start to read the Bible, you begin to see the hopelessness and depravity of the world today. And you can get very depressed by that. You could lose a lot of hope. It's crazy. It's crazy. I wonder about men and women who want to take on a leadership role, who want to become pastors. You know, one of the things I've learned about the Jewish people is a lot of excitement that goes on with people that go to Ancestry.com uh, or they, they take their DNA in one way or another and say, Oh my goodness, uh, I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish. And they begin to celebrate. Do you know that Orthodox Jewish people become very curious about that? Because they wonder to themselves, why would you want to be part of a people that has suffered so much and that the world even looks at in a very hostile way today. Nobody in the history of the whole world has ever been tormented and persecuted like the Jewish people. Not a people in the history of the whole world. Nobody even comes close. And today, they are still despised and they are still hated. You know, I was in, a lot of you guys know I was in, in Sweden recently. And I can tell you that the Jewish people there are moving out in droves. Because once again, just 60, 70 years after Adolf Hitler and everything that happened with Germany, it's coming back. And there is this huge animosity. I'm talking about people painting huge swastikas. I'm talking about people beating up Jewish people in the streets in Sweden. And not just in Sweden, but in other parts of Europe and Scandinavia as well. So they say, why would you want to celebrate the fact that you're a Jewish? Do you know what you're actually pronouncing? Do you know what it means to become one of us or to be one of us? And it's the same thing with the Christian, not just the Christian who has the bumper sticker, not just with the Christian who goes to church once every 90 days, but the real Christian who studies the Word of God to know who Jesus Christ is. Do you know what you're signing up for? It's not an easy road. Oh, and you want to be a leader? You want to be a pastor? Oh, you want them to call you apostle? And I still don't know what that's about. But you want all of those things. You might be signing up for something that uh, you have no knowledge of. Right? So, when we become Christians, things don't always go exactly as planned. But one thing for sure, you will win the battle. You will have the victory. You will be blessed. Your life will be transformed in a way that doesn't even come close to the best and highest blessings that the world has to offer. And that's the reality of it. What we're going to do is we're going to read uh, Judges chapter 6. We're going to go from verse 30, uh, 11 to 33, I believe. And it occurred to me on the way over here... This is an Old Testament book. I mean, I knew it, but I, I, it came to my mind. What came to my mind, I should say, is what some of you might be thinking because we're going into an Old Testament book. 
I happen to love the Old Testament because it is such a clear and great illustration of the New Testament, which I personally have trouble with. I have a very peculiar way of learning. I don't seem to learn the way most people learn. And one of those things that is so peculiar is that I have difficulty understanding the New Testament until I'm familiar with the Old Testament. And I have uh, difficulty understanding the Old Testament until I become familiar with the New Testament. Right? And it makes sense actually because it's one book. But in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 4, one that you never want to forget, especially when you go into the Old Testament, is this. And Paul, the Jewish rabbi, he wrote this. He says, whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That is the Old Testament that was written before. That we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. That's why the Old Testament was written. We will learn from their mistakes. We will celebrate their victories because when we see how closely their life and their circumstances mirror our own today in a New Testament way, then we celebrate with them, right? And we'll see them in heaven one day and we'll talk all about it. I wanted to get a good reader to read this, but uh, some of you guys are afraid and nervous, so... I'm going to read it and I'm going to do the best I can. Follow with me. We're in Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 11. And the reason that we're there is because last week we went through Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. And so we gave you the backdrop of Gideon and what's going on in, in Israel. So we'll continue on. Now, if you weren't here for that, you can go on our website and you can find it. The message is recorded on there. This is what it says. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abrazite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all His miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, <coughs> O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot. And he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. Then the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it is still in Ophrah, the Abrazites. Now it came to pass <clears throat> the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock. In the proper arrangement and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. 
So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down. And the wooden image that was beside it was cut down. And the second bull was being offered on the altar which had been built. So they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, because he has torn down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the, one, let, let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself, because his altar has been torn down. Therefore on that day he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he has torn down the altar. Then all the Midianites, Amalekites, and the people of the east gathered together, and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. He blew the trumpet, and the Abrazites gathered behind him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who, all, who also gathered behind him. He also sent his messengers to Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and they, camped, uh, and they, ca and they came up to meet him. So that you know going in, any time you read about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, you are talking about Jesus before the New Testament. And the evidence is here. Whenever you read about an angel appearing to a man in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament, you will never see that man kneeling without being interrupted by the angel telling him to stand up. You will never see that man offer worship to the angel in any way, shape, or form because angels are not to be worshipped. But here, Gideon is worshipping the angel titled the angel of the Lord because this is not just an angel, this is Jesus Christ. It's called, some Bible scholars will call it a Christophany. That is Jesus Christ, very present in the Old Testament. And why would we be so surprised? When we open up the book of Genesis, in the first chapter, God is having a conversation with somebody when He says, Let us create them in our image. Who is He speaking to? Well, obviously, two other parties that have creative power. So now you go all the way to the book of Colossians in the New Testament and you find out, lo and behold, Jesus Christ was the architect of the universe. And without Him, it says, nothing that was made would be made. So this is clearly Jesus Christ that we're talking about, which is why I offer you Luke chapter 19, verse 10, when it says, when Jesus said that He comes to save that which has been lost. And Luke chapter 4, verse 18, when He says of Himself that He claimed to, to heal the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, right? And to, uh, and, and to offer liberty to those who are oppressed. And so... Today, there's probably no greater oppression and bondage than the spiritual sickness and the spiritual death that we see happening before us today in this world. You say, Mara, I don't see it that way. I see a rosy world. I see a flowery world. Things are great. Things are looking up. Do you know how many people are employed now that this president is in office? Do you know that our vice president is a Christian man? Mara, don't you listen to the news? Listen, my problem, and I always share this with you guys and whatever I speak to, my problem, the difference between how I view things and some of you view things is that I study this book maybe too much. And when you study this book too much, it's like talking to a person who needs glasses but doesn't have them and you do. You follow what I'm saying? I see things more and more the way God sees things. And I see the depravity of man. And I see it not only here in the United States, but all over the world. And so if you can't see it, it's only for a lack of knowledge of God's Word, which breeds blindness. 
So before you say, Mario is wrong, I disagree with him, I don't see the world, I want to think positive, Mario is so negative. Start reading this, or not, if you don't want to see things as they are. And it's not that I don't have hope, because this book has an end, it's in the back, and I know who wins. So it's not that I don't have hope, but presently, what I see leaves me continuously heartbroken. And I see a lot. And I counsel with people. And I see, and I meet with women who cheat on their husbands. And I meet with husbands who cheat on their wives. And I talk with children that have been abandoned. And I talk to people that have been raped, that have been victimized, that have been beaten. And I talk to people who have literally no hope at all because they know and I know that they are worshiping and serving a God or a higher power that doesn't exist. So I know what happens to them when their head hits the pillow at night. Oh, they talk a good one when they talk to people. But in the evening or when they really need a God that can change their circumstances, they are completely hopeless because they know that the universe and the ocean and the trees and nature and certain, uh, you know, Buddha and all these other, that they're dead. And they know that there is a creator of those things while they are worshiping the creation. I know that and they know that. And it leaves, I'm not celebrating, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. It leaves me broken hearted. Because I know it doesn't have to be like that. And the God that I know in the Bible loves those people immensely in a way that I can't even describe with words. So much more than what they claim their God loves. In fact, when you hear people talk about those other gods, very rarely, if ever, will you ever hear them speak of intimacy. Very rarely will they ever, if ever, tell you the name of their God because they themselves don't know. And yet Jesus stands at the threshold of their life. I'm here. I love you. Can you hear my voice? Do you understand that the life you're living is not the one that I want to give you? Do you understand that you put obstacles between me and you? That's why you're living in such misery. Do you understand that? But the ears are deaf and the eyes are blind. It doesn't have to be that way. But it breaks your heart when you start getting involved in, 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 minor, in ministry and like that. And you know, I got to tell you, I've told you already, I am nobody special. But once in a while, God speaks to me. And oftentimes, He does it to encourage me. And, and then sometimes to just confirm that the road that I'm on is the road that He put me on. Because I'm a lot like Gideon. You're going to see in a minute. I begin to doubt God. Especially when things don't turn out the way that I think that they should turn out. And some of you and, and some of the other people that we talk to, that we minister. Some of the people watching you know, online and like that. They're a little bit like Gideon's people. They're suffering from a variety of things. You know, maybe they're not suffering financially. Right? But spiritually, and the bigger problem is that they can't see it. And so what do they do? They become, they, they become conditioned to accept their situation and their circumstances as they are. And they say, acceptance. Oh, the answer is acceptance. I'm accepting the jacked up circumstances in my life today. I'm practicing acceptance. There's a lot of things that they're accepting that they don't have to accept. There's a lot of things that God has, the God of the Bible anyway, is capable in wanting to change in their life, but they won't let Him. They won't let Him, and He stands at the door. You say, so Mario, how did God speak to you? Well, I'll tell you how He spoke to me. On Thursday, I don't know, about 3.30, 4.30 in the morning, something like that, I had a dream. I don't have a lot of them, but every once in a while. I've had a couple of visions in my life. I've shared them here before. We don't have a lot of time to go through them all. And sometimes God speaks to me in a voice that I could hear here. Inside of myself. Not with these ears of flesh, but inside of myself. I'm nobody special. He will speak to you anytime. You'll see in the story of Gideon. He's willing to speak to anybody. But I had a dream. And I had been studying, of course, all week in, in, in the book of Judges, chapter 6. And I had a dream that I got a call regarding a very good friend of mine uh, who struggles with a lot of issues, a uh, good friend of mine in the 12-step uh, fellowship that I'm a part of. And the, the, calls to, the person who called me said, this person, your friend, is in the hospital, and he's about to die. You should go visit with him. 
And I thought about it for a while. And I thought, well, what will I do if I go? What will I say to him that I haven't already said? How will I pray for him? And, and this is familiar to me because I've gotten, in reality, I've gotten a lot of calls like that over the years. Anyway, Lorenzo and Camille decided to go with me. So we went to the hospital and a doctor greeted us. And I forget who it was, but one of us said, we're here to see so-and-so. And he said, I'm sorry to inform you that so-and-so has passed. And I said, all right, let's go. And he said, why don't you come and see him? He's in the morgue or that area where they freeze the bodies and they put the toe tag on. And I said to myself, I don't want to go see him there. But Camille and Lorenzo said, let's go see him there. If that's the only way we can see him, let's go see him there. So I reluctantly went in my dream. And the doctor whose face, I knew he was a doctor. He had all the, the, the uniform on, the tag and everything like that. But I couldn't recognize his face. I couldn't tell you what he looked like. And there's a reason for that. My wife told me after I had the dream. And so we walked through this maze of a hospital. And we walked down below and then down further and then down further. And we entered into a very large room, maybe the size of this. And it was, I remember, a hole in the hillside. It was a cave like the one that we find the people hiding on here in the, in the book of Judges chapter 6. With a big opening. And it was very dark in there. And when we walked in, there were bodies laid out on tables of concrete everywhere. And it was so cold that ice had gathered around some of the bodies. At that moment, I, said, I told Camille and Lorenzo, I said, let's go. But they had kept walking, so I had no choice but to follow them. And we went there to where the body of my friend was. And something occurred to me. These people aren't dead. They're asleep. And in my dream, I started to preach to these people the same way I'm preaching to you now. And to my surprise, many of them came up off of their concrete beds and they started to walk towards me. And I could see the eyes of my friend opening and closing. He was ready to come up. He was becoming conscious again. The surprising part, and what got most of my attention, what stands out most in my mind, is that in this morgue, all the people that were there, not all of them woke up. Those who wanted to, those who responded to the truth, did. And uh, I woke up, I was still preaching when I woke up. And I told Camille my dream. And Camille said, you know who the doctor was? I said, no, I couldn't make out the face. She says, it was the great physician. He was leading you there where the dead people were. Like he's doing today. <laughs> Every once in a while, God speaks to me. And he confirms these things to me. You say, that's beautiful. That's awesome. I would like that to happen to me. It's readily available for anybody. Anybody who would. But I can tell you this. If you worship the way we worship before we started here, it's probably not going to happen. We got to meet God halfway. Well, it says there that, um, or what we find from last week is that uh, in Gideon's day, the people were in a very hopeless state. They were living under oppression and fear. They were living in the caves up in the mountains. Right? And they were starving because last week we found out that every time they would make something grow or they would spot a couple of sheep out there, the Midianites and the other enemies would come and they would just take it from them. And so they had to do everything in secret. And so they were living in fear of the enemy, fear of the future, fear of the unknown. And they thought, and they were living with this horrible fear, that God had abandoned them. Have you ever felt like that? I have felt like that. I have felt like that. Even in these last 17 years that I've been walking with the Lord, I have felt from time to time, and I have even accused Him of abandoning me. And it's a horrible feeling. And so these people were paralyzed with fear. But what they did, rather than stand up, rather than call out to the Lord, they sat and watched all the blessings that were intended for them get stolen. And they watched every hope being destroyed. There are a lot of people doing that today. They're sitting in a spiritual funk. They're making pretend. They're trying to convince themselves that their life is okay. And all they need to do is accept it. And their life, man, I don't want to, I want to be careful of the words that I use. But their life is not very good. 
And so these people, like people today spiritually, they were living in caves and they were having to hustle and hide for just a little bit of food that they could find every day. And last week we found out in the first 10 verses, listen, they waited seven years before they called out to the Lord. Seven years. Year one went by and it was horrible. Year two, year three, but they just kept making believe. No, no, we're okay. Nobody starved to death yet. We're fine. We'll just have to accept our circumstances. And they waited seven years before it occurred to them. God can change this. And maybe He will if I repent. And we're going to see later on that God begins to do this. And so in verse 11, we get a picture of this. Because if you read it there, it tells us that Gideon was threshing the wheat in a wine press. If you go with us to Israel, I'm going to show you how they used to thresh the wheat. And I'm going to take you to a wine press. But a wine press is an enclosed room. Okay? And that's where they would press the gate. Now you want to keep flies and other things out of the, 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 the wine when you're, when you're squeezing the grapes. right? You want a, you know, a private place. Gideon is in there hiding as he's threshing probably a little bit of wheat. So to thresh the wheat, you stick the fork in there and you throw it up into the air. And what happens is the kernel of wheat has, uh, what is the shell that's on it? Lahana, what is the shell that's on the, the kernel of wheat? The husk. The husk. And so what happens is you want to thresh wheat up on a hillside where there's a breeze. So that when you throw up the wheat, the wind blows away the husk. And then you're left with the wheat, which is what you want. You don't want the husk. But Gideon is in a wine press doing it. Because he's got to hustle and he's got to hide from the enemy. Because if they found out he had wheat, they would take it. This is the condition of the people's lives in this chapter. And this is the condition of many people's lives spiritually today. They've got nothing going for themselves. And every blessing that God intended for them, they had forfeited it. And some of them are saying, well, I'm pretty blessed. Oh, God wants to give you so much more. But your God has no power, therefore He can't. Right? So, at the very same time, that Gideon is threshing the wheat in this little wine cellar, God appears to him and says something strange, almost completely contrary. He says to him, the angel of the Lord, calls him a mighty man of valor, which means courage. Oh, courageous one, threshing the wheat in the wine press. <laughs> Why? Does God refer to him, when he's living like such a coward, why does God refer to him as a mighty man of valor? And if we're going to be honest, we would ask the question, is God ignorant? Is God blind? Does God not really know what's going on? Well, the answer is no. Then why does he call him a mighty man of valor or a mighty man of courage when he sees him living like a coward? Because God sees his children never in their present state. God always sees His children as His finished product. Did you know that? God doesn't have difficulty with that. I have difficulty with that. I want a lot of you to change and I want you to change tonight. <laughs> and I want to change tonight. But God would tell me and has told me in the past, Mario, you're going to have to love them with as much grace as I have loved you with. And you're going to have to overlook a lot of stuff. And just continue and continue working with them. Because that's what I called you to do. In the book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. We're told that we can be confident of this very thing. That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. And notice the word he. It is not you. Strong men, healthy men, able men have a big problem with this. They have a big problem keeping their hands and their personality out of the way. They have a big problem trying, always trying to manage things and thinking that they can direct them one way or another or thinking that they can fix things for God, including themselves. And I know why. It makes me feel like less of a man sometimes, especially if I don't know the love of Jesus Christ. But it's very clear here. It says that He 
who has begun a good work in you will complete it. It is not about you. It is not about your work. It is not your way. It is his way. And he begins what he will finish. Not you. All you and I are capable of doing is getting in the way of things that he's trying to do. And so God, the other thing is, he never abandons his people. But if you're going to get honest, you have probably accused him of that. And I certainly have accused him of that. And yet, yet, his promises have always been contrary to that. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 6 and verses 8. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, the New Testament. God assures us that he will not leave you or forsake you. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, it says God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. In Psalm 138 verses 7 through 10, David says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. But if you're like Gideon, if you're like me, you believe more, more in what your eyes see than what your soul knows. And that's a big problem that many, many Christians have. I would challenge you in your quiet time. If you have quiet time. If you do devotions in the morning or in the evening or in the afternoon. whenever you do, If you do them at all. I would challenge you that next time you do. Imagine to yourself what your life would be like if you really knew that God was with you. What would your life be like? If you really knew, if you really could see, if you really understood that He was always with you, what would your life be like? Imagine that. You're going to see a very different picture for your life. Meditate on that. That's a good one. Meditate on that. Hold on to that. And the other thing is this. If you need a sign, like God gave to Gideon. Remember Gideon? He said, if it's really you speaking to me, do such and such. If you want a sign from God, ask Him for one. But do it with sincerity and willingness or you're not going to see it. God doesn't play games. There are a lot of people say, Well, if God is really, let a drop of water fall on my forehead from the sky. Whatever it is, if God really, He will give you a sign. But do it with sincerity and do it with a willingness. And notice how sincere Gideon was. At a time when there was hardly no food. Not for him, not for his people, not for women, not for children, not for nobody. He offers a baby goat and an ephah of bread. Which is about 12 pounds of flour that he used. Okay, this is what he offers God. And there's no record that Gideon's complaining about it. Instead, we see that he's offering the sacrifice gladly, without complaint, and not trying to manipulate God. Some people think they can manipulate. I'm going to give $300 because I need $600 at the end of the month for next month's rent. God will not be manipulated. Why would people think that? Because the idols they were worshiping before they came to Jesus Christ were like that. That's the kind of relationship they had. So now PTSD has come in to the new relationship with a new and everlasting God. That's what's going on there. And so Gideon wasn't playing games. And so sometimes, listen, how we sacrifice to God and the amount of our life that we sacrifice to God will be in direct measure of our sincerity towards Him. I'm going to say it again. Sometimes how we sacrifice to God and the amount of our lives that we sacrifice to God will be in direct proportion to the measure of our sincerity towards Him. Remember Jesus said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know what pastors know? 
that the people who give more sacrificially, I didn't say the people who give more. Because a guy who's worth $10 million gives $100, that's one thing. But the lady who lives on a fixed income of a couple of thousand dollars a month gives $100, that's a whole other thing. So I didn't say, you know, how much. But those who give more sacrificially, us pastors know. Those are the people you can count on for places of leadership and service. The other people are going to blow away like the chaff when you're threshing wheat. They're here one minute, gone the next. Because their treasure and their heart lay somewhere else. It's the amount that you sacrifice. And I'm not talking about just finance. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your, using your gifts to serve. Those who give more are always those who are sacrificing more, are always more those who are more sincere about their relationship uh, with God. And it's not, understand this, that God needs your sacrifice. How many people here think that God needs your money? Absolutely not. Now, if you listen to some of the people on television that have two jets and a mansion in Newport Beach, and they are literally crying tears, telling you that if you don't give, God can't do the work, you've been brainwashed by somebody who I despise. Because what that person is really saying is that God is broke. God filed bankruptcy last week, and if you don't give, He will never come out of His financial hole. That's really what they're saying. They're misrepresenting the God of the Bible. He doesn't need our sacrifice. And here in chapter 6, when, uh, when Gideon offers the bread and the little goat, does God need it? Does the angel of the Lord eat the meat? No, He burns it. It's consumed by fire. So every sacrifice that we make to God is for what if He doesn't need it? To exercise your faith and my faith. Because faith is like a muscle. You will use it or you will become flabby. Faith is like a muscle. And God gives us many, many different opportunities to exercise our faith. When there's problems at home. And you say, oh, Pastor Mario, I've been trying to minister. I've been witnessing to my wife and my kids at home and, and even the neighbors. That's great. That's great that you've been doing that. But when calamity falls, right? When the, the earth opens up and it wants to swallow you, and it's on a Sunday or midweek, and you're not in church, do you know what you're really saying to these people that you're supposedly trying to minister to? That your circumstances are bigger than the God you worship. You see, we can talk a good one, but it's the way we live our lives. In my life, and Camille and I used to fight quite a bit early on. In my life, I would fight with her and then not go to church. Well, I'm not going to church, then stay home. I'm going to church because my God is bigger than you. I said it here several weeks ago. Didn't mean to sound offensive. I hope nobody took it that way. But I said what my pastor taught me. My wife is just my wife. She's not my God. My wife is just my wife. My mother is just my mother. My children are just my children. They will never be in the place of God in my life. You say, well, that's cruel. That's harsh. No, that speaks to them. That speaks to them about the power of my God and the relationship that I have with them, which is the relationship that I want them to have. And it won't happen with just a lot of talk. Right? And so... He also says here that um, in verse 22, it says, Now, now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Shalom. Shalom in Hebrew, it means peace. Peace be with you, the Lord said to Gideon. And this is the whole thing. This is the crust. This is the nut. This is the very core. This is the center of what you are all looking for. Of what the whole world is looking for. It is the peace of God. If you possess that, I promise you, I'll write it in blood tonight. You will never want anything again. If you experience the peace of God in love, you will never want anything again. 
And the whole world and Christians, everybody is looking for the peace of God. The problem, they're looking for it in all the wrong places. They believe the magazines they read. They believe the billboards that they see. They believe the commercials that say, if you just had this, then you'll have the shalom, the peace of God. If you possess this. But if you don't, it's just like everybody else. It's a lie. The world has been lying to you and to me. Read the Bible. Get into the Word. You'll stop believing uh, the lies. And so what happens is this peace, how can it be found? How can you possess this peace? You possess this peace, this peace when you approach the God of the Bible with sincerity and sacrifice. Did you understand that? I'm giving you something that is gold right here. You will possess the peace of God when you approach the God of the Bible with sincerity and sacrifice. Sacrifice nothing, you will gain nothing. Sacrifice little, you will gain little. And the peace of God that you're really looking for will evade you all of your life. I just gave you gold right there. The world should pay millions of dollars to hear what I just told you. They're not going to, but they should. And here's why. Because coming to believe, which is what Gideon did in verse 22. Now Gideon perceived. Now Gideon has come to believe. It was an action. It wasn't just words. It was an action. That's what coming to believe is. It is an action, not just a word. Let me prove it to you. In James chapter 4, verse 8, Jesus' half-brother said, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Who draws first? Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Who draws first? We make the first move. A lot of people don't want to do that. Which is why I was telling you guys what I was telling you when we started out with worship. It is so important that you take that opportunity to draw close to God. Then you're going to hear the words of God in a way you've never heard them before. You guys know who Martin Luther was? If there was no Martin Luther, we would still be in the Catholic Church. One day they told Martin Luther, we would like to hear God speak in our church today. And Martin Luther said, you will hear his words even in as much as he were to be here speaking them himself, because I'm going to speak them to you. <laughs> Coming to believe is action. It's not just word of mouth. You must draw near to God if you expect Him to draw near to you. My wife and I, we love to go get massaged. And over where we live in Roland Heights, it's not expensive at all. It's like $25, $20 something for a whole hour. And when we go get a massage, all we're expected to do is sit there and enjoy it. That is not how you're going to establish a relationship with the God of the Bible. He is not there to sit you down and give you a massage. He is there to draw near to you, but only in as much as you will draw near to Him. You can't expect it to be any different. And so what is sacrificed? There's sincerity and there's sacrifice. What is sacrifice? Don't go home and buy a little goat and, and, and bake a few loaves of bread. We don't do that anymore. We are New Testament Christians. What is sacrificed, understand this you guys, what is sacrificed is your entire lifestyle. He doesn't want half of you. He doesn't want a fraction. It is your entire lifestyle that He wants. How should your entire lifestyle look? It should resemble the life of Jesus Christ. It should resemble what is here in the Word. That is very convicting. How convicting is that? How far are you from the Lord? How little have you sacrificed? How little sincerity do you have? That will determine how convicting this, uh, these verses are. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Like what, Mario? Like drugs. Like fornication. Like selfishness. Like self-centeredness. 
It's all about maturing in Jesus Christ. And when you do, that is evidence of your sacrifice and your sincerity. You become a new person that resembles Jesus Christ. If that's not happening, you got to check yourself. If you want what God has to offer you, you got to check yourself. Measure. You have a measuring stick at home? 36 inches is a yard. If it's 33 inches, that's pretty good size, but it's not a yard. You got to measure yourself against the Word of God, right? And compromise should not be part of your process. Because it says that not only did Gideon tear down and burn that altar of that fake higher power, but he replaced it with an altar for God. And although Gideon lacked courage because he did it at night, Right? If he was the bold hero of the Bible, he would have went out there in broad daylight, but his faith is still a little weak. But you know what? I like that. I like that I read that. You know why? Because that tells me, listen, that all of us are in our process. And I tell you guys here all the time, because this is Recovery House of Worship, and because you guys are into recovery, most of you, through that 12-step process, I understand that a miracle hasn't happened, that you didn't come up here last week and I slapped you on the forehead and you were slain in the Spirit, and today you have become the full image of Jesus Christ. You go to some churches and they expect that. Oh, no, we don't, Mario. We don't expect that from the people. Then how come they come in smoking and you criticize them and want to burn them at the stake because the following week they're still smoking? How come you want to burn them at the stake because they got saved two weeks ago and they're still cussing? Why? Everybody is in their process. And God is giving out His grace individually as you and I need it. We're all very different. There's some areas of your life where you're doing so much better than I am. And there's some areas of my life that I'm doing so much better than you. But I can't see your heart and I can't see your soul. Therefore, it's none of my business. It's between you and God. It is my business to come here and tell you what the Word of God has to say to you. And, to, and what it has to say to you, I should say it without any uh, uh, compromise. So, here's the thing, and we're going to close with this. <clears throat> there are things that you're going to struggle with. Those things are a direct result of your experience with the gods that you were worshiping before you came to Jesus Christ. And your previous lifestyle oftentimes reveals what you were worshiping. All I got to do is sit and talk with you for a little while and I'll pick it up. Oh, you used to be a Buddhist. Oh, you used to be Hare Krishna. Oh, you were a fornicator. Women define your existence. Right? Oh, your God was money. Oh, your God was whatever. You say, Mario, you're real smart. Not at all. Not at all. But I'm into this all the time. All the time. And so I have discernment that God has given me through His Word. could happen for anybody. Just get into the Word. Nobody's special. Right? It's like spiritual PTSD. It'll be difficult to see and understand that Jesus is not like the other gods you were previously worshiping. He's so much better than that. His love for you is so much more. And I'm not going to go through it because we're running out of time. But as you finish those verses, you find out something really strange. You know what you find out? We read it. The Israelites who are worshiping this fake higher power, this idol, when Gideon goes to destroy it and he burns it, they come out and they say, kill Gideon. And they say, why? He said, because they burned the temple of our God. And you're disputing for Baal. You better believe it. You're defending your God. You better believe it. Well, what kind of a God are you worshiping that you have to defend Him? Oh, I know. A powerless God that you've been calling powerful. You say, well, Mario, we defend Jesus, don't we? Never. If you're trying to defend Jesus, you're doing it all wrong. You say, well, what is apologetics? Apologetics is explaining why you believe. You never defend Jesus. If you're trying to defend Jesus, you're not very wise. First of all, you can't possibly do it. The world's bigger than you are. His enemies are more than you can number. 
And second, you don't know him very well because he defends himself. The question was asked many years ago in Bible college, in my apologetics class actually. How do you defend a lion? Ah, uh, and there was a lot of interesting comments. But then the professor said, you're all wrong. The answer to the question is this, you don't defend a lion, just open the cage, he'll defend himself. And that's the power of our God who just happens to be the lion from the tribe of Judah. You don't have to defend him. He's not like other gods. He's perfectly capable of not only defending himself. He doesn't need anything you want to sacrifice to him. He's perfectly capable of doing all that for himself. And changing your life. But you've got to make the first move. You've got to put him first in your life. First. Over and above everything else. And I'm sorry, but a lot of times that is just indicative of you getting to church on Sunday and being the part of the no matter what team. In recovery, they got the no matter what group or what do they call it? The no matter, the no matter what do they call it? What is it? The no matter what club. That is, we don't pick up. We don't pick up drugs or alcohol no matter what. And they celebrate that. But when it comes to church, it's not really no matter what. It's, well, you know, if, if this is not going on, I'll, I'll be there. You know, if that's not going on, and maybe I'll be there. And when it comes to morning devotions in the Word, I'm, I'm kind of busy, man. You know, i got to make ends meet financially. See, all of that comes with these ideas, that spiritual PTSD that we have because of the ideas and the things we picked up from the other gods we used to worship. Don't bring it into the relationship with Jesus Christ. You'll sell yourself short. He wants to bless you and give you.